message that we heard from it this morning. Lord, may our hearts be open to whatever your spirit wants to deliver to us. We pray that you will be with Ron as he speaks this morning, that you will just give him a clear voice and anoint him for the power of the spirit. And we thank you, Lord, for the safety that you gave to people traveling on the roads this morning. And thank you for a, a warm place to be able to worship you here in this building. And Lord, I will pray for those uh, persecuted church throughout the world where they do not have places like this. Lord, I pray that you would minister to them as well. We think, Lord, of uh, the Christians in Ukraine and the suffering that they're going through. But we thank you for their endurance and for their commitment and how they are trusting you. And now we ask that you would be with uh, each one of us here in this congregation. Bless those who are watching online. We pray that the equipment will work well for that. And we thank you for the opportunity to worship you with our gifts. And we ask that you would uh, just use this offering to further your gospel. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
vacation, even though I think I see him in the congregation here. <laughs> uh, so he has asked me to go and talk this morning, and, uh, and it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to do so, so I always thank him for these opportunities. Uh, this morning, as you can see, uh, our topic is going to be the rapture. So we don't typically get into this in, in morning services. I know there are churches that have the very first message I ever preached from a pulpit. I got the opportunity at a church that was training us to be preachers. It was in 1985, and it was on this topic, and that was a much shorter version. So I thought, you know, every time things start to get a little haywire in our culture around the world, this becomes a hot topic. Uh, people want to discuss this. So I thought, well, things are things are a little different now than they've been. So maybe it's a it's a good time to bring this up. Um, just to let you know, it's going to be a little Bible study ish. Okay, by the very nature of the topic, it's going to be a little Bible study ish. So um, there will be slides that have verses for you to read, and I'll also have you following along different verses in your Bible to keep you busy. So that will be part of our message this morning. And I'm going to open a word of prayer, and then we'll jump right in. Father, we thank you for this time together. We just, again, praise you for this beautiful, warm building we're sitting in now. And again, Lord, we just praise you for that, for that blessing. And we just pray for those around the world that do not have these kind of facilities. And so help us to use this one to your glory wisely, uh, bringing the gospel to this community, and even around the world through our missions and uh, over the Internet. So we just ask for a time of... Uh, Again, attention, and help me to do justice to your word this morning, and it's in the name of Jesus we ask this. Amen. Now, thinking of, thinking of an illustration for this, you know, I've got a memory from 1976 I'll share. This is interesting. Uh, about a year or two ago, I had a message, and it, it included something called the castle. And when I was a teenager, this was a big part of my life. Believe it or not, in New Jersey, uh, in the northern part of New Jersey, uh, it's very rural up there. Even to this day, it's, it's building up, but it's still very rural. And uh, you know, about 45 minutes north of where I grew up, which was a very uh, city area, uh, there was a real castle in the, in the wooded area called the Clinton Road Castle. And we would go there on Friday nights and Saturday nights and scare the daylights out of each other and party and everything else. But one of the things that was kind of weird is on the way up there, coming out of the city area of you know, Wayne, where I lived, on the way up to this castle, there was a Dairy Queen on this, I mean, on the main highway that was just hidden in the woods. I mean, you wouldn't have expected it to be there because you had city and then you had rural, and in between here, in the middle of this road, there's a Dairy Queen off to the right side there. And, well, it was a favorite place to stop on our way up or on our way back. And I remember this one time, I hope I'm telling this accurately, Lord, because it's been like 45 years or so ago, but we, we had pulled in, and it's dark, and uh, my friend Steve was driving, and there were three of us in the car, and up in that area, it gets very foggy and misty at night, so here it is dark, and they didn't have the white halogen lights like we have today, but they had those, you know, like the box lights, and at the back of the parking lot, one of those lights was sitting, and it was on an angle so that the light came straight down at the back of the parking lot, and then it angled in. Well, we pulled in, and we're having our ice cream, and this other car pulls in back by that light. We're at the front, and there were three young ladies in there about our age. So my friend Steve gets all full of himself, and he's I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to invite those girls to come with us to the castle. And we're all saying, you ain't got the guts to do that. Oh, I'm going to do it. And so he gets out of the car, and he walks back there. And we're, we're all amazed, and he's having a conversation with them. And it's interesting, because right behind him, it's just pitch black. And there's a curb here, and they're parked like this, and he's standing on the driver's side. And you know how a, a guy that age might be a little bit shy, he's pulling one of these things, you know, blah, 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 he's talking to them. And he's stepping on the curb, and he's stepping off the curb, and he's talking and talking. And we're like, he's having a conversation with them. And then all of a sudden, as he steps up on the curb, he vanishes from sight. And the, the three girls start laughing out loud, and they drive right by us. And they're laughing at us, and we go by. So we get out one over there. We didn't know this at the time, but be, behind that curb was a drop-off. <laughs> so he, he just stepped up on there, and he put his foot back, and whoop, and uh, we don't, he, he went down a few feet. 
<laughs> we come up with all the trickers and things in his hair. I mean, he disappeared. And a, and a flash and a sprinkling of an eye. I think to myself, boy, how pertinent would that be to this morning? <laughs> all right, thinking, thinking of the rapture. How many of you ever heard that word before? How many of you? How many of you, this is the first message you've ever heard on this? All right, good. So hopefully we'll, we'll add a few things to your knowledge on this particular subject. Let's see if we can get this baby going. Translations and uh, look at this the Latin Vulgate. 
is available on this particular site, the Latin Vulgate. And um, does anybody spot the word up there that might look like rapture? Right there. Rap by the way, if you listen to this, rapiator, okay, is the word. That's where we get it from, but even there. If you put that word into a Latin translator, there you go. We will be raptured. That's where the word comes from. It comes from the Latin Vulgate. So again, now you're, you know, this is one of those things you can impress your friends with. Now, where did the word rapture come from? It doesn't come from our Greek New Testament. It comes from the Latin Vulgate. We will be raptured, which means to be caught up. To be caught up. Now, one of the problems with this view, especially in modern times, I'm seeing more of this now than ever. There are different views of the rapture. Now, the view we would hold here at Midway Baptist would be what we would call a pre-tribulation rapture. There's also the mid-tribulation rapture. There's the post-tribulation rapture. There's even a pre-wrath position. And um, we're going to focus on two at this point. Two. And that's the pre-tribulation rapture, and we're going to also the post-tribulation rapture. Get that smile off your face, Krauss, okay? <laughs> One of those views is dead wrong. And it's interesting when you look at how this plays out. Turn over to Matthew 24. We're going to see where a problem arises. It's in Matthew 24. Because remember, Paul tells the believers in his day, in 1 Thessalonians 4, to comfort each other with these words about the catching up, about the rapturing of the people, of the believers. In Matthew 24, we do have a little bit of a, a problem here. And it's really not when we look at the context. Because there's a context here. I have a quick question for you. In Matthew 24, for you scholars out there, has the church started yet? I see heads going like this. Perhaps will not come in. All right? Has the church started yet? No. The church starts on Pentecost. After Christ dies on the cross, is resurrected, okay? Meets with his disciples for 40 days. The Holy Spirit comes at the beginning of the church. The church is not here yet. And in this particular context, watch this. Chapter 24, verse 1. Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? But surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now you think about that. that. That's a mind-blowing statement. I mean, that was their center of worship. That was their life. And Jesus comes out and says, you know what? Every brick on this place is coming down. So it tells us in verse 3, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming? Here's the key phrase, and the end of the age. This is what gets everybody all worked up. Because right Every time we see world events going in a bad way, we want to know, is this the end of the age? And Jesus gives them some things to think about. We won't read every verse here, but you look at verses 5 about false Christs. Verse 6, wars and rumors of wars. Verse 7, nation against king, nation, kingdom against kingdom, pestilences and earthquakes. It goes on to verse 9, persecution, deliver you up to tribulation to be killed. But the key verse, the key verse here, is in, we want to go to verse 15. By the way, now remember, Jesus is speaking to Jews here before the church. He's speaking to Jews, and he tells them, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Stop right there. Context. Jesus is speaking to Jews that will be in Jerusalem at this time. That's what he's saying here. When you see the abomination of desolation, this is mentioned in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, this is a key event that signals the end. That hasn't happened yet. You know why? What is the holy place in context to those Jews right there? It's a temple. Is there a temple in Jerusalem right now? see some hands. You can say, no, there's no temple there yet. So what this tells us by inference is someday there's going to be a temple there again. And someday something called the abomination of desolation is going to go into the temple. And again, we're doing a study in the book of Daniels in the ABF, so if you want to learn about the abomination of desolation, it'll be about three weeks. We'll get into that in detail. 
But the context here is a Jewish context, very Jewish. It's not being directed to the church at this point. Then you go on down to verse 27, and this is where the confusion can come in. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So go down to verse 29, pay attention. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect in the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. The problem right there, verse 29, we have to deal with. When does Jesus say that he's going to come and gather his elect from the four winds of heaven, according to verse 29? After the tribulation of those days. So there are those in Christian circles that would say, you see, the church will go through this time of tremendous judgment by God on the earth, known as the Great Tribulation. In fact, if you go back to verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no nor ever shall be. <clears throat> great tribulation, it's a time unlike any others in earth history. It's different. This is God pouring out his judgment on the earth. This is different than what we see happening today when you have different Nations fighting against nations. We've had World War I, World War II, Revolutionary War, Civil War. That's not God's judgment being poured out. You almost say that's man's inhumanity against man being allowed by God. But the Great Tribulation is a time when God will then step into history, judge the earth for its wickedness, and it's unlike anything we've ever seen before. So here's the question. Is he talking to the church here when it says immediately after the tribulation of those days, he's going to come? I see it. You got it right yet, right? That's not the context. He's talking to Jews. And now here's where we got to do some Bible study. All right? The Jews in the Old Testament and in Christ's day had an eschatology. Now, again, here's your million dollar word for today, Bill. Remember, eschatology, the study of end times, okay? The completion of things. Here is what a Jewish person in the Old Testament and in Christ's day would have believed about that time period we call the Great Tribulation. And again, I've only picked a few verses, Aaron. Again, we don't wanna, I don't want to pick 20 of them, all right? So they always ask, why don't you use this one? We only have until 1130, okay? <laughs> so in the book of Jeremiah, ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with a child. Here's a good picture. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins? If you've ever played a sport and got kicked there, you got the picture, okay? And all faces turn pale. Alas, for that day is great, and so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So look up here. You've got Jacob's trouble. Who does Jacob represent? Israel, right? And it says it's a time like none like it. Very similar to what we read in Matthew. Zechariah chapter 13 and 14, at the end of chapter 13, going into chapter 14. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them, I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. But you look at here, though. Two-thirds of the people in Jerusalem at this time are going to be massacred. But one-third, God says, I will bring them through, and that one-third that comes through will do what the nation of Israel has not done yet. The nation of Israel rejected Christ as the Messiah when he came the first time. At this time, they're going to realize, as a nation, who he was, and they're going to turn to him. goes on in the next chapter, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, 
but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. See, the Jewish people had, they knew what, they knew what Jesus was talking about. We know as a nation, based on our Old Testament prophecies, when this time of trouble comes, we are going through it as a nation. We will go through it. You know what's interesting here? It also says in the next verse,
There are no references to us as we are today in the Old Testament. You say, do that, how do you know that? I'm going to read you some verses here. Pay attention. Paul writing to the Ephesians. By the way, were the Ephesians Jewish or Gentile? Come on, Augusto, from the diaphragm. Gentile, right? The Gentile church. Maybe a Jew or two in it, but this is the Gentile church, the city of Ephesus. And Paul writes, for this reason I call the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you, Gentiles. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the, this is your word, mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. This word is key, mystery. So what is the mystery? Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. He's defining a mystery of something you're not going to find in your Old Testament. It's now being revealed by us, by the holy apostles and prophets. And that mystery was this, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. The Jews had no clue what was coming, that there would be a Jew-Gentile organization or thing called the church. You can't find it in the Old Testament. It was a mystery. You're not convinced? We have another verse. Colossians 1, 24 through 27. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Same definition, verse 26. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations but now has been revealed to his saints. Again, a mystery, as he's describing it here, has been hidden from ages and from generations. You will not find it in the Old Testament. And what was the mystery? He finds that for you. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. They had no clue what was coming, that there would be one day a Jew-Gentile, co-equal, co-equal group under the Messiah. Here's a cool little passage. Go over to Mark chapter 7. It's kind of cute. Verse 24. It's going to show you the mindset of the Jewish people in the first century. And that the Gentiles even knew what that was. This will show you what the Jews thought, how the Gentiles would be blessed. How the Gentiles would be blessed by the Messiah. <laughs> It says here, and from there, he, Jesus, arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but could not be hidden. For a woman, whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, heard about him, and he came and, and she came and fell at his feet. Now, right? the woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. So here you have a Syrophoenician-born Greek woman coming to Jesus, and she says, Jesus, you got to know my daughter. She's got a demon. Watch what Jesus says here. <clears throat> Let the little children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Now, what's Jesus getting at here? In the Jewish mindset at that time, now, I don't think Jesus is agreeing with the Jewish mindset. He's repeating it. All right? In the Jewish mindset is this. The the Jews were the bee's knees right now in God's eyes. All right? His job was to feed them first before he threw the crumbs to little dogs. That's how they viewed the Gentiles at this time. And her answer is amazing. I love this. Verse 28. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. And the way she's looking at it is, I know you Jews look at us like little, like, like little dogs under the table, but even the dogs get the scraps that fall off the master's table. And in the Jewish mindset, Gentiles would be blessed through the Messiah that way. They would sit at the king's table as his children, 
And the Gentiles would be blessed, kind of like little dogs. And those of you that own little dogs know what I mean. Is whatever falls off the table, the dog gets a little bit of a bite of that. And then he goes and said, he, he responds, for this saying in verse 29, go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. But that was the mindset of the Jews at this time. Gentiles would never sit at the table with us. We're God's people. They're like the little dogs under the table. They'll be blessed by the crumbs. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, here's one verse that just gives you a slight hint. It says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Judah and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. That's about the extent of what they knew. He's not, we're not going to sit at the same table with Christ and the Jews or the Messiah. He's going to be like a light to us. But the idea of co-equal, co-heirs is foreign to the Jewish mindset at this time. All right, one more. Romans 16, just to kind of finish it off, another definition of mystery. Now, to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God through the obedience of faith. All right, so what do we just discover here? When Paul uses the term mystery, and he's describing something, that something he's describing, where won't you find it? From the diaphragm. Old Testament. All right, it's interesting here. I want you to remember the resurrection we read about in Daniel chapter 12. All right? There's another one mentioned here in 1 Corinthians. Look what Paul starts this out as. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Stop. Where won't you find what he's about to say? Man, you guys are getting it. All right. Even Ron said it. You mumbled it, right? In the Old Testament. What won't you find in the Old Testament? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Based on Paul's own interpretation, could that be the same resurrection that Daniel's talking about? No. Different group of people here. Daniel's resurrection is of his people, the Jews, which we know takes place at the end of the Great Tribulation. This is the resurrection. It's a parallel passage to 1 Thessalonians 4. This portrays, this pertains to the church. Now, again, just to kind of hit this, this idea, when Jesus was on earth, his teachings were not toward the church. Just say we, we gain insight there. We make application. But when Jesus was teaching on earth, he constantly talked about things pertaining to the Jewish kingdom that was coming. Now, Acts 1-3, if you want to look this up, go ahead and look it up in your Bibles. This is after Jesus has risen from the dead. He's appeared to the disciples for 40 days at this point. This is just before he goes ascends to heaven. And it tells us what he was doing during those 40 days. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to how to shepherd the church. Is that accurate? I see your head shaking there. You know why? If you look it up, that's not what he was talking to them about for 40 days. If you put the right person there, it says, speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So he wasn't there teaching them about the church at this point. He's still talking to them, hey, when I return, I'm going to set up a kingdom. He's, all the promises that God made to the Jewish people in the Old Testament are going to be fulfilled. In fact, here's one of the ways we know that's what he was teaching. <laughs> Later on, it says, therefore, when they had come together, after 40 days of his teaching, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Israel. And he goes on to say, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. In other words, that's none of your business, all right? I got another job for you to do. This is when the mystery is now going to be revealed. This is the beginning of the mystery. And you want to think of a gut punch. Remember, the Jews at this point, you can see even right here after those 40 days, they're probably salivating 
for the beginning of the kingdom. And remember, they were under Roman rule. They were under the iron fist of Rome at this point. And you know, Peter's probably thinking, all right, I threw the first punch up on, on in the Garden of Gethsemane. That wasn't it. And uh, because they just couldn't wait for Jesus to vanquish the Romans out of that area. And so now they're thinking, okay, 40 days, or we didn't get the resurrection, we understand you had to die and rise again. We got that now. Okay, are we ready for the kingdom? Are you going to go beat up those Romans now? Are you going to get our land back? And that's what he tells them. Not for you, no, I got something else. And I want you to think of this. Go to Acts 1 8. This is the Great Commission in the book of Acts. This is a gut punch. They're looking for Jesus to establish the kingdom, the, the kingdom of Israel for them. And he says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. All right, if I'm Jewish, yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to be reaching my fellow countrymen. Uh, but then he throws on a couple caveats. And in all Judea and Samaria. What did the Jews think of Samaritans? He like them. Uh -oh. and then he goes on. Are you ready for this? And to the end of the earth. You know who lives at the end of the earth? Us. Right? Gentiles. The little dogs. To make matters worse, that's how he leaves them. You know, hey, um, the kingdom's coming. Ain't now. None of your business when it is coming. Here's what you're going to do until it happens. You're going to go witness to those Samaritans. And you're going to go witness to a whole bunch of Gentiles. And then what happens? He ascends back to heaven. And it says, it, it just says they're sitting there walking at him. Huh? See, the knowledge of the church begins to start here. The church is a separate entity from the nation of Israel. Those promises are coming for Israel. But we also have some promises as well. You know what's interesting? Even though Jesus told them that before he left, that you would witness in Samaria to the ends of the earth, did they run out and do that on their own? It's not until you get into Acts chapter 7 when Stephen is, is uh, martyred. Uh, then it says they scattered and they went out preaching the gospel everywhere. All right. Now let's take a look at some verses that are written to us. That are written to us. In the book of Revelation, chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. This is the beginning of this great time of turmoil, the great tribulation. And it comes on to say here, as the sixth seal is opened and things are stuck, all hell is breaking loose. And it says, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Look at verse 17. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? All right. You ready for this one? Here's a, here's a message written to the church. Right after we get through 1 Thessalonians 4, we go to 1 Thessalonians 5. Billy, see number 4, 5? All right, making sure you're following with me. All right. That, there's no chapter division there. It goes from this promise of a catching up, a rapturing of God's people in the church, right into this whole area of a time of great trouble. And at the end of that message, for God did not appoint us to what? Say it. Wrath. Wrath. But to obtain the salvation through our Lord Jesus. Remember? That is the great day of wrath. The church is not appointed to that. This is a comforting message. Also, in the book of Revelation, we have seven churches that are listed there. And we've done studies on this in the past. Five of those churches have a negative comment made about them. Jesus kind of does an employment review of them. And it's kind of what we call sandwiching. You know, mentions what they do good, mentions what they do bad, and then tells them a corrective action. Two of those churches that are faithful have nothing negative said about them. One of them is the church of Philadelphia. Another one of those passages. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming upon the earth. There's another verse that goes directly towards the fact that the church, the faithful, are not destined to this time period. So when it says in Titus, you know, the blessed hope, it's a blessed hope. We're seeing a lot of crazy stuff happen today, right? How many of you would love for that to happen right now? 
Now, I think of it like this. How many of you have ever seen some of the movies? I just watched one. It was called Left Behind with Nicolas Cage. And uh, it was a Hollywood version. And uh, during when the rapture occurs, this is all speculation. We don't know what this is going to look like. But this gal is hugging her little brother in a, in a mall, and all of a sudden, whoosh, the clothes fall down to the ground. And there are planes with no pilots and cars smashing into, into pylons and, and driving into malls because the, the, you know, the, pat, the driver was raptured out of there. Um, and there were always little piles of clothes laying around. I thought one thing they forgot is, I hope for me, I have a fake bridge here and I got about five pounds of metal in my hip. They should show some of that stuff with like fake teeth and, and prosthetic joints sitting there as well. And I have no intention of taking this garbage with me. <laughs> But it's interesting. It's interesting that you know how they do that, but we just don't know. All that to be said, does this mean that we will never suffer trials on this earth? This is one of the problems with the rapture idea. Too often I run into people that anytime things are starting to go sour, everything is about the rapture because they don't want to deal with anything. And that's not the case because the other faithful church is the church at Smyrna. And here's what Jesus says to the church at Smyrna. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Here's a great message. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. Now, there were Christians through World War I, World War II in those areas. They said, that went through it. But that is not the great tribulation. The great tribulation is God's judgment on the earth. It's very different. You read that from Revelation chapter 7 onward. The types of things taking place are unlike anything we've ever seen. And we've got to promise that we don't have to go through that. So what do we do with this? A lot of head knowledge, right? Turn over to 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3, and we'll close in these passages.
Who knows, maybe on the planet today there is that last Gentile. We believe this is what the fullness of the Gentiles is. When the last Gentile of what we call the church age accepts Christ, we believe the clock will switch back to God going after the nation of Israel to bring them to himself. So Krauss, you may be that evangelist. Get out there and find that person. Right? We want to hasten this day. We want to bring this about. In the meantime, we want to live godly, righteous lives. And also, wow, I got a name from Lisa. Anyway, that's, that's the point. I'm going to close this in a word of prayer. And the uh, worship team will come back up. Father, we thank you for our time together. Lord, tremendous, tremendous. There are so many facts and details we can look at and play with. Father, we, we know this. You are sending your son soon. And how soon, we do not know. We need to be ready. We need to be uh, doing your work in the meantime of uh, bringing souls to Christ. And it's in his name we pray this. Amen. Please rise.